Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, everybody. Very happy to be to be here and uh, to present a little bit what I do with my team in uh, in Accenture. So my name is Antonio De Donno. I'm uh, responsible for the digital experiences team in Accenture Labs, and I'm based in Sofia Antipolis in south of France, in the French Riviera, a very, very beautiful place. I really ask you to come and visit. It's, it's a really nice place to live. So Accenture, Accenture Labs actually is a special place inside Accenture. It's the R&D unit of Accenture. So it's, it's a, a unit composed by different groups. And in Accenture Labs, actually, we focus on problems and techniques that don't have an immediate solution today. So our outlook is to find solutions for things that maybe will hit the market in three to five years. That's how our outlook. And in my team, in Digital Experiences, what we do is basically human-centered computing and human-machine interfaces. We have groups based in San Francisco, in Bangalore, and in Sofia Antipolis. And over the bigger agenda, actually, in Sofia Antipolis, we focus on three main streams, robotics, immersive experiences, and haptics. When I'm normally asked to uh, give, a, in a nutshell, what we do in my team, I like to show this image because it really shows what where do we place ourselves? We are really at the boundaries between the physical world and the digital world. We try to work with robots. We try to make robots work with humans in a collaborative way. So we try to create um, robots that are intelligent enough to understand what's going on with a human, what is the human intention, what's next maybe in a more complex task. And our robot can really assist during, uh, um, during a complex task. But we also look at robotics from the teleoperation side. So how can a human control a robot from a distance? And how can the robot also send back information to the human? Because one thing, when you, when you operate a machine in general, a robot from a remote place, then normally you don't have any feeling of what the robot is doing on the remote place. So we work on having what is called force feedback transmission back to the, to the user. And then we go totally on the other end. So we go full in the digital world. And there we um, try to create immersive experiences where humans can interface themselves with the intelligent system and have what we call multisensorial experiences. I will go through details in just a few minutes. So basically what we try to do is to create a digital world by leveraging different technologies, different uh, results, uh, different uh, cutting edge uh, hardware and software that we may find. So basically, we leverage everything in robotics, in VR, XR, in optics, in IT in general. And we create a digital world that for us is uh, industry agnostic. So we don't have a specific industry in mind. We have some topics, we have some challenges, and then we try to find solutions and then find use cases where this, these solutions can be, can be applied. And when you talk about creating a digital world, the first thing that comes into mind maybe should be Digital twin. You probably overheard this word. Digital twin is everywhere in the mouth of everybody. But what is what is exactly a digital twin, and what is our process for creating a digital twin? A digital twin is a replica of a real system. Simply say, but you may have different levels of complexity of your digital twin. Normally, what I like to uh, to present as an approach is uh, this four-step approach. You start to create the visual model of your digital twin. So you want this model to appear and to look like the real system. But it's not more than just a shallow uh, model. So it doesn't do anything. It just appears like the real system. What is really important is the second step. So including physical simulation inside your digital twin. If you have something in the digital world, you want this to react like the real system. You don't want this to be just a, a video game or a serious game in which you interact, yeah, but you can tolerate some imperfections and some, some approximation. You want your digital twin to react to have the same friction, same backlashes, same uh, inertia like in the real world. So the second step, the physical simulation is really important in order to get a very realistic um, simulation at the end. And once you have your digital twin fully functional, then you may use it for several reasons. So for instance, train. Imagine that you have a company which does, which does mass production, for instance, of a product, and you want to train new workers on the assembly line, but you don't want to stop your assembly line because you're running 24-7. So why don't you create a digital twin of your assembly line and ask people to train with that to understand what's the procedure and what, what they are supposed to do in a safe and replicable way? So you don't need to stop your business to train new people. But in this training part, it's important 
how much the user is immersed inside the simulation. Because otherwise, if it's just a simple interface where you click some buttons and you see things moving, you say, okay, I maybe understood what I have to do. But if you really try, if you really have sensations of what you are doing in the virtual world, that would be something that when you go on the real site, you would say, okay, I already experienced that. So I'm, I, I can start working from day, from day one. And then once we are fine with the digital world, we go back to the real world. So we close the circle. We are not just playing the digital world for the sake of it, but we are going back to the real world. And since we, uh, we work on human machine interfaces, so we try to find the best way to control a system. What is the best way? What is better than having the replica of the system to control the system? So normally when you do teleoperation, you use joystick like devices and you need to learn what a movement on the joystick, how a movement on the joystick affects the movement on the real system. What if you manipulate the real system and you see the constraints and you see what the robot can do, for instance, in a virtual environment and control the same robot somewhere else. So I'm going to detail a little bit more these four steps during my presentation. Starting from the first one, actually the creation of the digital tuning, which may seem set formal. So you probably know what the most common 3D scanning technique, LiDAR scanners or 360 imaging. So there are several ways to create a visual model of the digital twin. Sometimes some companies already have assets, so they don't need even to, to scan uh, a workflow or a, a machine. They already have the CAD models of them. But sometimes it's also interesting and useful to um, be able to update the, uh, your digital twin or your digital environment, because maybe you just bought a new machine or maybe there was a change. You don't want to rescan everything. You want just to update one single part. So this part is essential for giving the right feeling to the customer, to the, to the user, that after a few minutes of adaptation, he will start to feel that it's really inside the, the realistic environment, the, the real environment. And having the physical simulation embedded into the digital twin, as I was saying before, that's fundamental because otherwise you can create frustration, you can create uh, maybe, you don't take it seriously, actually. You just say, okay, it's a game, it will move, yes, but never like the real system. So it's important to take care of the first part, otherwise you will affect the, um, the effectiveness of the, of the digital twin at, at the end. And as I was saying before, uh, learning is one of the most important um, use case when you have a digital twin. Why? But because we are human and we don't like to read longer manuals, we don't like to read longer list of operations. So of course we have to do that, but then if you have a real um, experience and if you really manipulate your uh, your system in a virtual world and if you have good haptic feedback of what you are doing this will remain more into your mind you will be more prepared and a nice feature also is exploiting the metaverse side of the of the digital world so having multiple people collaborating together to perform a task because we are not only just saying a single player mode where i have to do a task i have to, to deliver something but maybe I can collaborate or I have to collaborate in my, my work experience with other colleagues that maybe are based somewhere else in the world. So it's also nice to imagine the digital twin inside the metaverse concept because it allows me to collaborate effectively with other people and exchange with them without having the need to, um, to travel physically and to be somewhere else. And I can recreate no matter which environment, no matter, no matter which situation, even the most critical ones. And for instance, in my team, we uh, here we are already seeing the video. We recreated a scenario uh, in which the user is supposed to evacuate an oil rig because of a fire. But before evacuating it, there is a safety procedure to be followed. So the, the user has to go uh, to open a bulb and open the, the water system to control the fire. There will be actually a live demo from, from my office with my colleagues showing you this demo in real time. Here we really use all the uh, immersive, ex immersive experiences technologies to recreate this scenario. But actually, uh, when you think about virtual reality, you normally, you, you may think about vision and hearing. Those are the two main senses that may come uh, into the mind of someone while uh, thinking about this digital world. And this is what we are used to. In the cinema, we already used to have a special sound, for instance. So we look at something, we hear a special sound, 3D sound, and we have an impression of where all the things are coming from. 
But for us, we want to go a step farther. We don't think that this is enough. So this, this already can create some, uh, some sense of immersion, but this is not enough. And we want to stimulate all the human senses, even the most complicated ones. So we go through the tactile feedback. We try to use systems to reproduce uh, sensation on the ends. If you consider that the fingertips are one of the most sensitive parts of your body, they can perceive uh, a change of texture of the, of the depth of 40 micron. 40 micron is out the, the size of a human hair. So if you think that the human body is so powerful to feel these differences, why can't we try to simulate it properly? So we try to study how we can reproduce tactile feedback, how we can reproduce also the smell. Because your brain, when you enter inside a room, the first thing you do is to look at the room, hear the, the echo of your voice to understand the size of the room, and smell it. And smell is an imprinting also in the brain. It gives you a memory. Maybe you can have a memory of a place after 20 years because just you, you feel a smell. So that's a powerful sense we have. And then taste, that's the most challenging one. It's still an open research topic. There are some groups worldwide working about what is typically called digital lollipop or retaste systems. Nothing exists, or very few products exist on the market, but we are trying to explore this field also in order to have really a full sensation. But since we are a human-centered group, of course we cannot isolate ourselves from taking into consideration the human that's at the center of the simulation. So we don't want to reproduce, we don't want to offer the same static simulation to everybody. We want to take into account how the user is reacting while being into a digital experience, into a virtual experience. So what we do, basically, we try to collect um, human body reactions, we try to collect biosignals, such as brain waves, brain activity, muscular activity, change of pH, heart rate. And all of this because maybe we want to uh, detect if someone is stressed during um, an experience like that, if he's uh, annoyed, if he's involved into, into the experience, and then tune the experience according to that. So the idea is not to propose the same story to everybody, but really to, to do a custom uh, experience according to the reaction of everybody. Because we, we saw and we observed that some people have dizziness when they, when they are in a virtual environment. Some people are distracted by many details. Some people are really involved into the, into the experience. So this diversity of reaction led us to think that it's important to take into account the human in the experience, not just having the same static thing. And we recently started to explore this multisensorial simulation in the healthcare and well-being uh, uh, environment. Here, that's just the, the beginning of a project we recently started in my team, which is intended to help people with memory issues. So how can we support people having cognitive and uh, memory issues to retain uh, objects, to retain, to, to develop short-term and long-term memory? So we propose different scenarios, and we will see also a demo later on from, uh, from my colleagues. We propose different scenarios. We ask people to remember objects and then to go again through the scene and replace them correctly at the, at the place in which they, they, they were at the beginning. And we do this both using VR technologies, but also just simple 3D technology, I would say, just stay in front of a, of a desktop. And then when we start to uh, play around this interface between physical and digital, we can also think about other use cases. We recently started a project with a very well-known uh, car manufacturer. And for them, we are exploring how car designers can uh, experience their ideas in mixing physical and digital. What does it mean? So car designers, they basically spend hours trying to uh, create a new concept for car interior and exterior, passing from their sketches to, the, uh, to a 3D model. And then the, this 3D model normally goes through rapid prototyping. They create maquette of this, uh, this car interior, and they are normally lengthy and expensive. But that's the only way for them to really see uh, realistically what they are going to, uh, to propose to, them, to the management. So we are working with them now to imagine how we can combine physical elements and digital elements in order to give these designers a realistic sensation of their design doing rapid prototyping, not waiting for a physical prototype, but experiencing and uh, using VR and optics, experiencing the idea and intervene online, changing maybe some options, evaluating, like, evaluating how much an option, one option can impact the, the design of the car, uh, the space around or the, or the illumination inside the car. 
And then, as I was saying at the beginning, we jump to the, back to the real world. So we create this interface, we create this, um, uh, this connection between uh, physical and digital, but then at some point we always have some machines in the real world that have to react to our, to our uh, requests. So what we do, uh, we focus, as I was saying before, to operating intelligent machines from a distance by having also force feedback. And we exploit technologies that are normally part of the VR environment, like, for instance, the haptic feedback and the haptic gloves. We try to use them also in the real world, because you don't need to be totally in a VR environment. You can be in an extended reality environment and maybe having some, uh, some haptic feedback uh, feeling on your hands. But we also explore how, in the collab collaborative robotics field, we explore how robots can take a part of the complexity of a task and do them autonomously. Autonomously doesn't mean they are pre-programmed to do something, but they understand something, they can propose a solution. They may interact with a human saying, I'm seeing that this is broken, do you want me to fix it? Or maybe they can take just an action if they are entitled to. I was seeing some questions before about uh, danger and how we, our robots can interact with people. It's up to us, we decide the rules and we should decide the rules about the, the boundaries of uh, autonomous robotics. But that's also one of the topics we, we, we work on and we like the idea of having the robot like a companion for humans, not totally a substitute, except as Maria was saying, when, when you have a dangerous task, of course, you prefer a machine to do it rather than risking your life. And the concept of teleoperation, I think, is uh, familiar to all of you. Uh, the use case we imagined was in an industrial environment. Imagine you have a few uh, skilled technicians that may need to go into different plants and be sure that there is a procedure that is uh, constantly checked and executed that way. And instead of doing that, we imagine having intelligent machines on site and the operator would remain remotely to control these machines and to be sure that the procedure is followed. As, uh, as expected. And this control can be really a full control of the robot, like we do in our, in our lab. So we have this four-legged robot from Boston Dynamics. We can control it using different interfaces. Here we are controlling it through a simple joystick. We are also now working on having a haptic device with force feedback for controlling the arm, which is on top of the, of the robot. Or, and this is something that very soon, my, my dear colleagues in Sofia Antipolis will show you. We create the digital twin of the robot and we interact with it. So we really grab it in the virtual environment, we move it, and we have the real robot somewhere else. In, in our case, it's just beside, of course, we are in our lab. I imagine it can be thousands of kilometers away. And the way in which you move the virtual robot, create a plan, create a, um, a scenario that you can uh, pre-visualize before sending, sending it to the robot. So you can also verify that the robot will do what you expect it to do before, uh, before controlling it. And with this, probably, I will now pass the, the line to my colleagues in Sofia Antipolis and let them show you live some of the things I was, I was talking about. Lorian, you are live now. Ah, wait, I need microphone. Lorian? Mm -hmm. Okay, you are live now. <coughs> oh, sorry. Oh, I need to move. Uh... Can you see me here? Now, yes, probably. Okay, perfect. Can you hear me also correctly? Yes. Perfect. So, hi everyone. So, as Lauren Salamon, I'm part of the Accenture Lab in Sofia Antipolis, and I'm very happy to be connected with you to show you part of the R&D use cases with Jeremy that you can see here in the windows uh, from the beautiful showcase that we have here in Sofia. So, I just would like to start to say uh, a word about what we are doing in the labs. I assume you have already a nice view uh, with the presentation from Antonio. But I also would like to say that globally in the labs um, uh, around the world, we are doing applied R&D. So it means that we are exploring different types of technologies such as virtual reality, robotics, artificial intelligence, bioinnovation, and so on. 
and I'll really apply them to tangible use cases. So here in Sofia, we are also shaping the future of different industry, such as life science, um, consumer goods, financial services, so really a different bunch of different type of, uh, of industry. Um, Antonio has probably already introduced uh, what the digital experiences is doing globally around the world and more specifically in Sofia Antipodis. With the map here, I also would like to say that in Sofia Antipodis, we have two other teams, one focusing on artificial intelligence. So more specifically, uh, what we are doing in terms of data privacy, how could we leverage AI to create um, synthetic data? How could we comply with different uh, regulation on the market? And uh, how could we preserve, of course, the privacy of uh, people in terms of data perspective? The other team uh, here in Sofia Antipolis is system and platforms. So here they are um, looking at high performance computing and also complementing the work on robotics that Digital Experiences is doing here in Sofia, but more from uh, robot to robot communication. So basically, if I have a robot split, how can I um, leverage them? How can I control them? So, and of course we have a beautiful uh, digital experiences team, but I don't want to spoil the rest of the tour because you are going to meet Jeremy uh, from Antonio's team to bring to life all the use cases that we have built in Sofia Antipolis. So here I'm connected from the beautiful showcase that we have in Sofia Antipodis, and we have, uh, let's say, created different type of zone, different immersive zone to really bring to life our research and the use cases developed by the R&D teams here in Sofia. And the goal is really to be, to say, okay, I'm a consumer, I may be an employee, how can I leverage different type of technologies like VR, AI in the context of day-to-day -day life? So basically, how can I interact with, with robots if I am on the field or different type of things? So I think uh, this is uh, all good in terms of introduction. I will then end over to uh, Jeremy to quickly show different type of use cases from the showcase. So Jeremy, back to you. Thanks you, Lorian. So hi everyone, my name is Jeremy. I hope that you can hear me well. Uh, so I think that Antonio already talked uh, to you about the, the projects we did with the, the team and all of our uh, use cases uh, during the, the last years. So at the moment, we are focusing on, uh, are focusing on a lot of uh, set parts, uh, more around the robotics and around the extended reality. So the goal of the team overall is to bridge the gap between the physical world that we are in and the digital world, so for example, virtual reality, uh, for example. So the first step uh, that we identify for that is to how we can bridge this gap. So the, the first use cases I wanted to show you on the, this screen is how we can create a digital twin of the pipes you can see uh, just there with me. So I want to create a digital twin to uh, integrate this digital twin virtual reality experiences, for example. So the first step is to scan uh, those pipes that we have in the phone and uh, the results of uh, those pipes are the, is the, the point cloud that you can see there. So this point cloud, I can manipulate it. And the goal is to create a, a 3D object, a CAD model uh, from this point cloud. So I have this point cloud. After that, I have uh, a mesh that I can uh, colorize, for example, uh, to, to have something more um, related to, to the reality. After that, I will have an improved mesh. So for example, you can see that uh, the, the mesh now is uh, polygonized. I have something more um, more realistic. And after that, we'll have a 3D model, a CAM model that I can interact with. So for example, uh, here the, the software is telling me that this valve has a problem. So I can uh, create another valve. I can integrate another valve to make some tests on the, the 3D model, for example. So I will here upload a new um, a new valve and I can change the model like that. So instead of doing it in reality, so each time changing the, the valve, I can do the test, the simulation on the digital twin and uh, it's uh, for the time and for the cost, it's better. And for example, I have over uh, data there, data on the performance, data on the, the production and also the sustainability, for example, uh, by changing this valve, I will uh, save uh, 4.2 ton of CO2 per year, for example. So now that we have uh, those uh, pipes, the digital tune of those pipes, the, the thing is, is that we want to integrate it uh, in virtual reality application, for example, for training. So we'll join my, my colleague Jeff, uh, who is in um, this 
big device that you can see there uh, called the Omni. Uh, so we create an application, a virtual reality application uh, with a, a lot of immersive tool. So we have, um, for example, so the Omni to, to work and to, to run for Jeff to, to know the distance in the application uh, instead of teleporting, for, for example, in the virtual reality application. We add also, you can see a tracker on the headset so Jeff can use uh, his hand directly. And in the application, uh, you will see in a moment uh, that we have the, the pipes uh, that we generate just uh, just before, yeah, just just here. And Jeff can interact with those pipes so we can do some, uh, some tests on the, those pipes. So here the, the use case is more, um, you, are, you are on the Auric platform and you have to escape from this Auric platform. And um, Jeff has to do uh, some steps um, to, to evacuate the platform, but he has to, to, to reach some security goals. So he can push some lever, turn some valves. And for that, we create an immersive uh, application. So the Omni, for example, we can add also haptic uh, feedbacks uh, with the, the, on the end. And also we have a Tesla suit, uh, a combination, um, a full combina haptic combination. Uh, for Jeff to feel everything in the in the app. So there is an example of what we did uh, with a digital twin. Uh, I will show you something now more around um, the medical aspect. Uh, so we are creating an application uh, for the, the memory. Uh, so I think Antonio just mentioned it. I will just show you a video of how it looked like at, at the moment. So we developed uh, what we call Memento VR. Um, so we have a 3D application, a VR application and a desktop application for that uh, application. And the goal of, um, of this is to, um, you are in an environment, you have the choice between three environments, and uh, the goal is to remember 10 objects and after you have to replace it. So at the moment we are creating, uh, like I said, 3D environments and also desktop environments to make some comparison uh, between what is the best for which people. And the goal in, the, in this application also is to create the most intuitive uh, user experience and user interfaces for the, the people to, to understand and to be the most, uh, you know, clear and the most comfortable in the, in the application. So there is the uh, one of the, the environment. So you have the, the apartment and you can, uh, you have the, the ends directly. So you can take an object, place it where you want. Um, so we, we made some, some tests to, to see where, what is the, the best for, for the people, the VR environment, also the, the desktop. And what we are actually doing is how we can um, improve uh, these applications. So, for example, a generative AI to create an environment directly uh, to, by, by the voice, for example, speech to, to 3D, uh, for people to be uh, more comfortable in an environment that he, he chose. And um, also we are leveraging with the, one of our team uh, in San Francisco um, how we can add um, uh, headsets like, uh, you know, EEG headsets to um, to take the performance of the people in the application and for example to predict what the people uh, will remember well what they don't remember well for example so it's we have a lot of um, of things to to improve in the application but it's a, it's a work in progress so uh, as already mentioned and i think antonio already mentioned it also uh, so we are working a lot around virtual reality uh, but also a lot around uh, robotics. So I will show to you uh, two uh, demos that we create uh, the few, a few years ago uh, around the robotics. So the first one, um, I talked uh, about a digital twin. Uh, so there you can see that uh, I have the, the panda, the panda robot. And the, the goal of the demo I want, I want to, to show to you now is how I can um, control this robot, but for example, I'm at home or, or remotely, and I want to take the, the control of this robot thanks to his digital twin. So I hope that you can see what I'm seeing, yes, in the in the screen just there. So you can see that I have the digital twin of the of the showroom I'm in, and also the, the robot, the, the panda robot. And what I will do is to take the, the control of the digital twin. So I can take it like I will take the, the real robot. We replicate all the physical constraints on the digital twin. So we'll ask him to, to go on a, on a few positions. So three, for example. I will complete my action. I will launch a preview for security reason to be sure that I'm, I don't make any mistake in the... In the oh, and I will execute. Um, so you can see that 
from the digital twin to the real robot, uh, the order are, sen are sending. And what is interesting for us is that the, the both are synchronized. So I can send order from the digital twin to the to the real robot, but on the other end, I can take there the, the control of the of the real robot, and you can see uh, that the the digital twin is also moving. So we have a bidirectional communication channel uh, between the between the two, so the digital twin and the, the real robot. And what is interesting there also is that we can program a robot uh, without any code. So you don't have to to know how to to code a robot. Uh, in Python or in C++, for example, you can do it directly with uh, this type of, uh, of application. So it's a, it's a type of, um, of teleoperation. So that was the, the first uh, use cases. And I will uh, show to you the, the second that we developed just, uh, just after. Uh, so you can see that there is this um, big control panel uh, that we, we create. And uh, what we, we did is that we uh, were asking a question. For example, I am a worker uh, and I have to, to go on each platform in France, on each uh, factory uh, to do some uh, maintenance procedure, for example. Uh, so each time it will be um, it will be costly for me. It, it's not really sustainable because I have to move on each uh, on each factory. And what do we create there is that you can see on the screen uh, the first thing that we create, we create a little environment with this little control panel uh, to ask a robot to do some operation to do some operation uh, remotely. So I can take and can ask the robot, for example, to, to click on a, on a button. So for that, we create, um, we create this, um, this interface. So you can see that the, the little control panel is uh, replicated. I can click on the button, for example, the 21, and the robot will click on the button 21 on the control panel uh, on-premise. So we develop this interface. You have the visual feedback. Uh, you have the log of the robot. You can also um, record some procedure and launch it uh, automatically. And we add also uh, some procedure, uh, some um, security procedure. So if I did an incoversional action or something that is not a routine, I can ask the, the manager approval to, to do it. So it's um, we try to, to create the most the security possible on the on the website and also we have something else is that if the robot has a, has a problem uh, we have a multi um, human robot collaboration on that uh, on that part so we can ask another robot instance the the spot that will come there and relaunch uh, the the panda so that was for the the first uh, version uh, we create also a vr application of that with a digital twin of the um, of the, the con little control panel and after that, we create a second version of the application with this control panel, uh, more complex. So you can see that there is uh, some there are some knobs, for example, a key switch, uh, a joystick, and circuit breakers. So we 3D printed some um, some part there to help the robot take uh, the the circuit breakers, for example. So we um, all the things that we learn from the first version with the little control panel, we we create that also on the on the the big control panel. So I don't know if you have any question on uh, on that part, right. on that part. But so we'll uh, hand over to Antonio or, or Lorian. Thank you, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Lorian. I thought it was more yeah. useful. Hi, Lorian. I thought it was more useful to show something live rather than just videos. So I'm happy to answer to your questions and thank you very much for your attention today. So the winner is, I feel sick anytime I'm trying VR. <laughs> Do you think I can get used it after a while? So it was a common question. Yeah, yeah. It, there are some techniques to reduce dizziness. Yes, it depends on how the VR, also how the VR environment is done. The dizziness comes from the fact that the eyes are seeing something moving while the ears are stationed. So you're not moving, your brain is tricked. You uh, have the sensation by your eyes that something is moving, but you are stationary. So that's what create this nest. Some people are more keen than others to feel that. On our side, let's say on the engineering side, we can do something to try to reduce it. Of course, there will still be people uh, sick of <laughs> VR. That's uh, something we cannot play on. But actually with the multisensorial um, experience, you can trick again your brain to have this sensation. And what, uh, what we showed before with the Omni platform, that's exactly for this feeling. So you move on an inertial platform, you work on in place, but your brain starts to feel that there is a movement ongoing. So that reduces a lot. So it's, uh, 
the secrets. Great. A quick question, I hope. Uh, how much does the Boston Dynamics dog cost? <laughs> <laughs> Just yeah. a sum. Short answer, but big price. Actually, uh, Boston Dynamics is not for uh, consumer selling right now. You may enter in contact with the uh, Boston Dynamics and ask for a call. I know that they don't have an official price and probably are not allowed to, to tell a final price. But it depends on many things. It depends on the options. It depends on what you ask them to do. We are in the six figures uh, range, so it's pretty expensive. Okay. We cannot wear VR headset all day. What can be the solutions? Are there some applications without? Yeah, right. So the VR headset, of course, is cumbersome. You don't want to wear a VR headset more than probably one hour, I would say. So the solution would be what is called extended reality, going through maybe some smart glasses, having uh, an overlay of digital content over the real life. So this uh, AR or XR uh, glasses are much lighter and less uh, less demanding. But I have to say that since the beginning, let's say early 2000s of the VR era, right now the new headsets are lighter and uh, slimmer. So they are starting to become more comfortable in that. Remains the fact that you we will not wear it uh, 18 hours per day. <laughs> that's uh, that's for sure. Exactly. Right now, immersive experience seem to require really expensive gadgets that are not affordable for everyone. How do you see this technology being adopted by the mainstream public? Do you think what will ever happen, or will it remain as a tool for very specific use cases? Yeah. So that's correct. But for as as it happens on every uh, consumer technology, it starts to be very expensive at the beginning, then you have the scale in production and it becomes accessible to everybody. I remember my father buying the first uh, mobile phone in, I don't know, 1996 maybe, and it was costing a lot, really a lot, like three iPhones of today probably. And right now you can buy a smartphone with 150 euros, even less if you want. So. It all depends to the scale of the economics. When more people adopt a technology, then it will become accessible to everybody. Let me maybe just add also, we were talking about social interactions and how robots affect and how also VR technologies can be uh, intended as something like a barrier to, to social interactions. Our vision is not to substitute the real world with the digital world, it's just to enhance humans in some part of their day, some part of their lives to interact with the digital systems. But of course, we encourage people to continue to, to meet each other and to have uh, relationships like in real life. So these systems are supposed to be, in our case, we put ourselves into a work environment and we see how these experiences can, can, can work in the work environment. It could be also in, uh, in the everyday life, but honestly, we should not be also scared of imagining a total digital world where everybody will work with a VR headset on. That's uh, a little bit alienating. Great. So maybe the last question, like if, if we can. Haptic tasks used to be a challenge for robots. What are the latest advances that made possible more complex tasks like catching or of unexpected uh, foreign objects? So I believe uh, I believe the question is about grasping of the robot. So how can robot? Is an example. One okay. One. Yeah. Um, as you saw probably in our video, we use a robot. So the, the robots are well known now, and then they, they have kinematics that we all know. What makes a difference is the end effect. So what is attached at the end of the robot? And right now we have robotic hands. We have special grasper. We have big low uh, graspers. According to the use case, you may imagine a different interface. In the industry, for instance, the vacuum is, is, used, is used a lot. So you have some vacuum pumps that just suck the object and move it somewhere. It really depends on the, on the use case. I would say that for a generic application, the robotic hand starts to have a good resolution and granularity to adapt to the, to the task. And also what is important here is the force feedback on the robot side. So not only what we transmit back to the user, but also what the robot is feeling while grabbing something, avoiding to, to just squishing uh, an object and applying the right force while grasping. It's a complex problem and there is just a research community only on grasping that's, uh, that's particularly important when you ask a robot to grab no matter what on a table. So it's not pre-programmed, it should adapt to what it detects. And we try to find the right end effect or to be more uh, general, more uh, more generic. Uh, we can apply to different objects and different consistencies. Of course, grabbing a hard object 
nothing to do with grabbing a soft object. Great. Thank you very much. I think we we on time and so many questions Great. were replied. So firstly, I think we should say thank you to our speaker. Thank you.